Chapter 9 of Living Time by Maurice Nicole. Two Psychological Systems in Man. To think about time, etc., ideas are necessary which collide at all points with our ordinary notions. Actually, we think from a reverse direction. What does this mean, and upon what grounds are we going? We have seen that the truest feeling of self existence is connected with a form of consciousness in which the time sense is altered. Also, in this form of consciousness, the universe seems to be in our brain. Ordinary consciousness, which gives no true feeling of self-existence, of life in oneself, turns things the other way around. The world is outside us, and our feeling of existence comes from the changing feelings of pleasure and pain, derived from our contact with it. As Ramsey experienced, these two states of consciousness, they presented themselves as complete contradictions. It would appear that two psychological systems exist in us, each starting from a different point and acting, as it were, in opposite directions, from outer and from inner. In that class of literature of the 17th century, which deals with the inner nature of man, we actually find diagrams which apparently refer to these two psychological systems. Let us look at a diagram made by Robert Flood in a work entitled Utrisky Cosmi, 1617. Here are two triangles which represent something in man's constitution. In one the apex is downwards, in the other upwards. We are at once reminded of the double triangles in the hieroglyph called the Seal of Solomon, representing the three dimensions of space and the three dimensions of time, according to Ospensky. As regards the triangle of its base downwards, flood, in another diagram, divides it from below into body, vital spirits and reason. The reason touches the base of the upper triangle at a point in the level which flood denotes as mind, i.e., the highest use of a man's ordinary reason touches the level of mind, mens. It is, however, merely a point in mind. The upper triangle terminates in man's sex as a point. We might say, then, that there is a point in man's reason and a point in man's sex that connect him with a level of consciousness on a higher scale than his ordinary one. But each is a mere point or little door in the other. Taking only the two bases of the triangles, upper and lower, we can consider them as lines representing two levels of consciousness. But it would be better to say that two systems of consciousness are represented by the two overlying triangles. With these two distinct psychological orientations in man, I would connect Ramsey's experiences. Aoife takes him out of one into the other. He then sees everything the other way round. He has a new feeling of I. In the same way can Tennyson's experience be explained, as well as all the experiences of new forms of consciousness described in this book. The triangle with the base upwards, ending below at the point on the level of sex, is related to the three dimensions of the invisible world. When consciousness is situated in this system, the sense of the life extended in time, the sense of eternity and of recurrence, and the sense of self-existence may all appear. They belong to the higher system which is concealed in man. When man is in his natural state, he is in the psychological system represented by the triangle with the base downwards. So if we study natural man, we will find only this system in him. But psychologically considered, man cannot be taken in terms only of one system. Some extraordinary paradox exists within his being. Another system is latent in him whose mode of action is in a reverse direction to the natural system, working from above downwards. If we are willing to follow this interpretation, it means that fully integrated man must be some combination of these two systems. Man is the ground in which two systems meet. They represent a paradox, a cross, something extremely difficult to bring into union. 
above all something which must be roused into activity because natural man is adequate to life and need not know the action of this second system. The task is to bring these two systems into relationship, not to seek one at the expense of the other. All the experiences we have quoted merely show the existence of another psychological orientation. That is all. Ramsey finds himself in one system and then in another, and as such they appear totally contradictory. The integration of man must be the reconciliation of these two systems, and this must mean the gradual awakening to the other system while remaining in contact with life. The principles belonging to the other system, the new sense of time, of I, of recurrence, must be related to life. The highest point of natural reason touches the level of such ideas, i.e. that which is best in our thought can touch another order of understanding. And similarly, the highest point of sex opens in the same direction. Plato says that when we start out on the path of knowledge, we become more and more uncertain about all those things we were certain about, and more and more certain about all those things we were uncertain about. We begin to undergo some sort of reversal. At a certain point, moments of illumination occur. Fire bursts forth from Epistle 7. Let us call this the birth of the active mind and connect it with the awakening of the second triangle or system in man. We understand so far that the attempt to grasp time differently has a clear purpose in view. It is to stimulate the activity of the second psychological system for which it is necessary to think from the direction of ideas. We also understand that to awaken this system we must have new conceptions of reality. It remains asleep in us as long as we take things for granted and are merged in the world of appearances. Since the two systems in man are respectively turned towards visible and invisible, we realise that the visible will not fulfil us, it will never give us our complete significance. They must enter into us something from another direction. Our certainties must become less matters of fact. Our fixed opinions must be loosened. It is especially the feeling we are right that we must suspect. We can imagine that such feelings confine us to the lower triangle. Also, since there are two systems in us, energies that should go in the direction of the higher system must cause some overaction of the lower system. As we are, we must be a confusion of the two systems. Now all ideas that help us to conceive higher space touch the higher system. To grasp time differently with the individual thought and feeling brings us towards the higher system because this system has not our time sense nor the notions that the lower system has. All the emotions and thoughts that belong to the upper system must be incommensurable with those of the lower. They are another world, yet one entering this world of the lower system. In a sense, one is discontinuous with the other, yet they are linked at two points. The full working of both systems would mean consciousness in all, in a six-dimensional world. The memory of all the life, or rather the direct knowledge of it, and the knowledge of recurrences, would enter consciousness. Our present momented psychology would be annihilated through being absorbed into something infinitely greater. Yet we would still be in life, but certain where before we were uncertain, and uncertain where we were before certain. Understanding the manifested world is only a part of an unmanifested world, it is then to be taken at that degree of all which appears to exist outside man as sensible environment. All that portion which remains unmanifested is that side of all with which man communicates internally. The object of stilling the senses is to awaken the interior perception of unmanifested realities, manifested reality lying outside us in that position of the all that our senses gives us. A higher conscious level, or the awakening of the second system, will therefore mean that we include far more of the world, i.e. totality, and so of ourselves, 
than we do when in the ratio which the natural level of consciousness gives us between manifest and unmanifest. Regarded in this way, we can think that the unmanifest degrees of the world lie within man as a series of possible inward experiences, mental transformations, reached through fuller consciousness and perceived as internal truth, or whatever other term we prefer to call it. Natural man, then, is defined by his conscious state. We, as natural, are a particular ratio between manifested and unmanifested, one common to the level of consciousness we have. But if there be higher degrees of consciousness, man is capable of striking new ratios and of seeing and understanding things that we, as natural men, will not comprehend, because this new ratio will only exist for himself and in himself. Thus for us, his logic will not be our logic, and his viewpoints will not be like ours. Nor will his opposites be our opposites. He may therefore be easily incomprehensible to us, for where we see nothing, he sees something, and where we see contradiction, because we are in parts, he may see harmony, because relatively to us, he sees more, more wholly, more of the whole. All expansion of consciousness means a more comprehensive viewpoint, one that includes what for us, with our limited consciousness, will appear as opposites, and remaining opposites for us hold us back. The opening of higher degrees of consciousness will not therefore be a process that will conform to our general ideas of things. There will always be something strange and difficult to understand belonging to it. If all new understanding were commensurable with old understanding, we could conceive that any right development of man, through which his sense of I gradually became connected with that I, which belongs to the level of consciousness above our common one, would not involve any reversal. A man would not have to begin again, but would need merely to expand his natural understanding and knowledge little by little. But consider for a moment Will any continuous expansion of our natural understanding ever bring us to a new ratio or to the idea of higher space? Do not all ideas that can create a new ratio reach us from a different direction from any that belong to our natural ratio and so imply reversal? Reversal in what sense? In the sense of beginning to think from ideas that can grow in all directions in consciousness, altering one standpoint in a thousand and one ways. Thinking thus, we do not think from sensory evidence or follow the logic that is turned outwards towards phenomena and is ever seeking to establish one chain of cause and effect in the shadow life of temporal experience. What exists in dreams at the sleep level ceases to exist in day consciousness. When we awaken, the outer world is around us and the imaginary world of dreams disappears. Is there not discontinuity in this? Suppose that we could awaken still further, awaken out of this day consciousness into the kind of consciousness that Tennyson awoke into. Would not our travel vanish, actually cease to be able to exist? And would this not be discontinuity? Have we not some right to say that all increase of reality must necessitate what must appear to us as discontinuous steps, like the rungs of a ladder, and that there cannot be any gradual growth of our present knowledge and understanding, turning into a wider knowledge and a broader understanding, but rather something in the nature of sudden revelations of truth, sudden moments of insight which turn us right around and give us new and even quite reversed meanings. Perhaps we do not realise how much was taught in the known historical past concerning the connection between greater reality of being and higher states of consciousness. I will give in the following pages some further material relating to the question of levels, beginning with a full account of Plato's myth of the cave, which I referred to briefly in the third chapter. Let us remember that this belongs to the 4th century BC. Quote, and now, I said, let me show in a figure how far our nature is enlightened or unenlightened. Behold, human beings living in an underground den, 
which has a mouth open towards the light and reaching all along the den. Here they have been from their childhood and have their legs and necks chained so that they cannot move and can only see before them, being prevented by the chains from turning their heads. Above and behind them a fire is blazing at a distance and between the fire and the prisoners there is a raised way. And you will see, if you look, a low wall built along the way like the screen which marionette players have in front of them, over which they show the puppets. I see. And do you see, I said, men passing along the wall carrying all sorts of vessels and statues and figures of animals made of wood and stone and various materials which appear over the wall. Some of them are talking, others silent. You have shown me a strange image, and they are strange prisoners. Like ourselves, I replied, and they see only in their own shadows or the shadows of one another, which the fire throws on the opposite wall of the cave. True, he said, how could they see anything but the shadows if they were never allowed to move their heads? And of the objects which are being carried in like manner, they would only see the shadows? Yes, he said, and if they were able to converse with one another, would they not suppose that they were naming what was actually before them? Very true. And suppose further that the prison had an echo which came from the other side, would they not be sure to fancy when one of the passers-by spoke that the voice which they heard came from the passing shadow? No question, he replied. To them, I said, the truth would be literally nothing but the shadows of the images. That is certain. And now look again and see what will naturally follow if the prisoners are released and disabused of their error. At first, when any of them is liberated and compelled suddenly to stand up and turn his neck round and look towards the light, he will suffer sharp pains, the glare will distress him, and he will be unable to see the realities of which in his former state he had seen the shadows, and then conceive someone saying to him that what he saw before was an illusion, but that now, when he is approaching nearer to being and his eyes turn towards more real existence, he has a clearer vision. What will be his reply? And you may further imagine that his instructor is pointing to the objects as they pass and requiring him to name them. Will he not be perplexed? Will he not fancy that the shadows which he formerly saw are truer than the objects which are now shown to him? Far truer. And if he is compelled to look straight at the light, Will he not have a pain in his eyes which will make him turn away to take refuge in the objects of vision which he can see and which he will conceive to be, in reality, clearer than the things which are now being shown to him? True, he said, and suppose once more that he is reluctantly dragged up a steep and rugged ascent and held fast until he is forced into the presence of the sun himself. Is he not likely to be pained and irritated? When he approaches the light his eyes will be dazzled and he will not be able to see anything at all of what are now called realities. Not all in a moment, he said. He will require to grow accustomed to the sight of the upper world, and first he will see the shadows best, next the reflections of men and other objects on the water, and then the objects themselves, then he will gaze upon the light of the moon and the stars and the spangled heaven, and he will see the sky and the stars by night better than the sun or the light of the sun by day. Certainly. Last of all, he will be able to see the sun and not mere reflections of him in the water. But he will see him in his own proper place and not in another, and he will contemplate him as he is. End quote. Dialogues of Plato. In his comments on this passage, Robin says, quote, Every degree in either scale is an imitation or image of the degree above between the absolute not being of total ignorance and the absolute being and supreme knowledge, there is a whole ladder of intermediate stages, fictitious copies of ideal realities by sensible nature. The symbolical objects of science between these copies and their patterns, and lastly the good which rules the intelligible world and gives it life, the good whose image in respect of the sensible world is the sun. All these relations are put in concrete form by the famous myth of the cave. With our fault in bondage to conditions of birth and upbringing, we are the captives, unable to move since our infancy, with our eyes before fixed on the back of the cave. The steep stony path rising to the entrance symbolises the difficulty of determining the nature and origin of our opinions. 
The great fire outside, which illuminates the cave with a vague light, is the sun, and the marionettes whose shadows are cast on the back are physical objects, which are certainly artificial things. The real actors remain hidden behind the screen. The prisoners hear the echo of their voices and take it for the language of truth, being chiefly intent on observing and remembering how the shadows on the wall appear together or in succession. When a prisoner drags himself or is dragged out of the cave, his dazzled eyes can make out nothing. To use them he has to be content with the reflected image of things. This symbolises the ascent of the soul towards truth. End quote. Leon Robin, Greek Thought. Concerning the allegory, Plato himself says, The prison house is the world of sight, of the senses. The light of the fire is the sun. And you will not misapprehend me if you interpret the journey upwards to be the ascent of the soul into the world intelligible to the mind, according to my poor belief, which at your desire I have expressed, whether rightly or wrongly, God knows. But whether true or false, my opinion is that in the world of knowledge the idea of good appears last of all, and is seen only with an effort. End quote, Republic 7. Let us turn to other conceptions of levels, not making any attempt to collate them, but seeking only the same general idea running through them all. There are some valuable remarks on levels to be found in Swedenborg's writings, which we can draw out of the mass of other material that does not enter into our discussion. He calls attention to two different kinds of degrees that apply to the inner psychical nature of man, remarking that we cannot understand a man's psychology unless we realise that these two different kinds of degrees exist. He calls them degrees of extension and degrees of ascent. I remind the reader here of what was said about dimensions. We can extend a line as far as we like, but it will never ascend into a square or a cube. The gradual increase or decrease of heat or cold, light or shade, belongs, Swedenborg says, to degrees of extension. They are continuous. In the same way, if we increase our knowledge of a subject, such as history or chemistry, we merely extend our knowledge by degrees of extension, but do not thereby strike into another order of knowledge. Degrees of ascent are discontinuous, i.e. inwardly experienced. They correspond to entirely new states of the individual. The perfecting of man, we are told, is a question of these degrees of ascent, not of extension. Quote, we are not speaking of the perfection of life forces and forms as increasing or decreasing, according to the degrees of extension or continuity, because these degrees are genuinely known, but as ascending or descending according to the degrees of ascent, or discrete, discontinuous degrees, because these degrees are not known. But how perfection ascends and descends according to these discontinuous degrees can be but little known from things visible in the natural world. End quote. The right study of things in the natural world, however, leads us only to the realisation that the more intimately they are examined, the more wonderful their contents appear. Quote, From the former we learn only the more intimately they are examined, the more wonderful their contents appear. Take, for example, the eyes, ears, tongue, muscles, heart, lungs, liver, pancreas, kidneys and other viscera. Also seeds, fruit and flowers and metals, minerals and stones. It is well known that the more these are examined, the greater the wonders disclosed. Yet an ignorance of discrete degrees has concealed the fact that all these things have a still greater inward perfection according to degrees of ascent or discrete degrees. The whole universe is constructed on the principle of degrees of extension and degrees of discontinuity. That part of the universe that is perceptible to the senses the world in space and time, and that part of the universe that is outside space and time, and so is not perceptible to the senses, are constructed of one only substance, which proceeding, quote, by means of atmospheres according to continuous degrees or those of extension, and at the same time according to those of discrete degrees or those of ascent, causes the variety of all things in the created universe, end quote. This cannot be understood, he says, 
Quote, Unless all idea of space be set aside, for otherwise appearances must necessarily give rise to fallacies. End quote. These discontinuous degrees upon which the universe is framed exist also in man, regarded as a microcosmos and an image of the macrocosmos. In natural man, only the lowest degree is open, so that he understands everything in a certain way. Swedenborg asserts that there are three discontinuous degrees in man. This triple ascent of discrete degrees also exists in the greatest and least things. Quote, they exist in every man by birth and may be opened successively. Each degree of ascent has also degrees of extension or continuous degrees, according to which it increases by continuity. End quote. When a man is born, he comes first into the state of the natural degree, and this is developed by continuity as he acquires various kinds of knowledge, and so develops his intelligence, quote, until he reaches the highest degree of such intelligence, which is called rationality. Nevertheless, the second or spiritual degree is still closed. It can only be opened by a love of use derived from intellectual considerations, but this must be a spiritual love of use which is the same thing as the love of neighbour." This writer observes that, quote, There is a difference between scientific truth, i.e. a truth which is merely lodged in the memory, whether it relates to religion or to other subjects, rational truth and intellectual truth, and they are successively attained. Scientific truth is mere knowledge. Rational truth is scientific truth confirmed by the reason. Intellectual truth involves an inward perception that the thing believed is true. End quote, Swedenborg, Arcana, Coalista. As an example of what he means by discontinuous degrees, he asks us to think of end, cause and effect. The end is the source of everything that exists in the cause, and the end of everything that exists in the effect. The end or aim, quote, must put forth something in which the cause may exist, and that it may be the source of everything that exists in the effect. There must be in the effect something derived from the end, from the cause in which it may be. These three, namely end, cause and effect, exist in the greatest and least things. End quote. He describes three levels of meaning or understanding. Thinking from ends, thinking from causes, and thinking from effects. Quote. quote Take note that it is one thing to think from ends and another thing to think of ends. Also it is one thing to think from causes and another thing to think of causes. And again it is one thing to think from effects and another to think of effects. To think from ends is the method of wisdom, from causes that of intelligence, and from that effects that of knowledge. From this it may seem that all perfection increases in and according to the ascent to higher degrees." End quote. To turn back to older sources in the Hermetic literature of the 3rd century AD, we find a passage in which three degrees of knowledge are spoken of, divine, cosmic and human. The divine mind is, quote, wholly filled with all things imperceptible to sense and with all embracing knowledge. The cosmic mind is the recipient of all sensible forms and of all kinds of knowledge of sensible things. The human mind is dependent on the retentativeness of man's memory, that is, on his remembrance of all his past experiences. The divine mind descends in the scale of being as far as man. The knowledge which corresponds to the character and extent of the human mind is based wholly on man's memory of the past. It is the retentativeness of his memory that has given him dominion over the earth. The knowledge which corresponds to the nature and character of the cosmic mind is such as can be procured from all sensible, perceptible things in the cosmos. But the knowledge which corresponds to the character of the divine mind, this knowledge and this alone, is truth. And of this truth, not the faintest outline or shadow is discernible in the perceptible cosmos. For where things are discerned at intervals of time, there is falsehood. And where things have an origin in time, there, er, there errors arise. End quote. Hermetica. 
From this standpoint, there is an ordinary knowledge with the meanings related to it that man naturally possesses through his memory of his past experiences. There is a second kind of knowledge that he can reach by study of the visible universe in which he lives. There is a third kind of knowledge that reaches as far as man, which he does not make contact with in any ordinary way. So according to this exposition, ordinary knowledge, scientific knowledge and the third kind of knowledge form, as it were, three degrees or levels. And the third kind of knowledge is not commensurable with the other kinds. It was called eternal, aeonian. The other kinds of knowledge are connected with time and with the world as it is perceptible to our senses. The third kind of knowledge from this interpretation is therefore not from the senses, it is from mind. It is not acquired from outside, though preparation for it comes from this direction. It was called active, while all the other forms of knowledge acquired through sense were called passive. Quote, everything that has sensation is passively affected. The good is the voluntary, the bad is the involuntary. Nothing in heaven is in bondage. Nothing on earth is free. End quote. Hermetica. We find traces of the same idea of degrees of knowledge, discontinuous with one another, in the writings of the early church fathers. Speaking of the interpretation of the scriptures, Origen says, quote, The weakness of our understanding is unable to trace out the secret and hidden meaning in each individual word. Men make little effort to exercise their intellect, or they imagine they possess knowledge before they really learn the consequence being that they never begin to have knowledge. The prophetic style is allowed by all to abound in figures and enigmas. What do we find when we come to the Gospels? Is there not hidden there an inner, also a divine sense? The way then, as it appears to us, in which we ought to deal with the Scriptures and extract from them their meaning, is the following, which has been ascertained from the Scriptures themselves. By Solomon in the Proverbs we find some such rule as this adjoined respecting the divine doctrines of scriptures. And do thou portray them in a threefold manner, in counsel and knowledge, to answer words of truth to them who propose them to thee. The individual ought then to portray the ideas of holy scripture in a threefold manner upon his own soul, in order that the simple man may be edified by the flesh, as it were, of the scripture, for so we name the obvious sense, while he who has ascended a certain way may be edified by the soul, as it were. The perfect man again, and he who resembles those spoken of by the apostle when he speaks. We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, but not the wisdom of the world, nor of the rulers of this world, who come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God hath ordained before the ages into our glory, may receive edification from the spiritual law, which is a shadow of good things to come, for as man consists of body and soul and spirit, so in the same way does Scripture. End quote. The Principes. In the system of Richard, the Scottish prior, 12th century, we find the psychical activities of man divided into six grades or levels. He divides these grades into pairs. The lowest pair belongs to the imagination and sense, and of this pair the lower is not touched by reason at all, while the upper is influenced by reason but is not reason. The second pair belongs to reason and its lower element inclines to imagination and uses its images, while the upper is our logical reason itself, which is capable of abstract thinking. Of the highest pair, the lower degree is above the logical reason and not of the same order, yet it is not outside it. It is like reason, only higher, therefore necessarily more comprehensive. Finally, the highest degree of all, the higher element of the third pair, whose lower is akin to reason, is outside the influence of reason and indeed appears contrary to it. As I said, we constantly meet with this view that there is a degree of conscious understanding contrary to our ordinary reason or anti-human as Bastian Frank terms it. Now we must connect the active mind with the upper degrees of this psychical ladder in man and the passive mind with the lower degrees. 
The passive mind is influenced by all that comes in through the senses. The highest aspects of it use ideas and concepts derived from sensory experience, natural ideas. The material of the active mind cannot be thought of in the same way. Its material begins with self-recognition, which is not derived from our senses. I will classify all those peculiar moments of understanding that come to us at times in which we catch glimpses of an order of truth that cannot be demonstrated materially as belonging to the traces of the working of active mind. The realisation that one is invisible is of this order. Tennyson's experience is of this order. To realise the remarkable thing that one is oneself and can be no one else is of this order. It would be possible to collect a great number of such experiences, only they can scarcely be described because the meaning behind them cannot be conveyed in words, except to anyone who has had a similar experience. Actually, these moments are of more importance than anything else in life. When such experiences take an outward form, when we see a person or an object in a sudden, absolutely new way, it is the awakened mind that sees through the eyes. We must remember that it is not a matter of the senses themselves. With the senses we see very little. When the mind sees inwardly the truth of something for the first time, this seeing is of the same quality as the seeing of something outside in a new way. Such traces of active mind are one's own experience. They always give deeper understanding. Momentarily, they are difficult or impossible to describe. They remain in a special part of the memory and have special associations. They are affirmative and undeniable at the moment of experience, though later we may doubt them because the passive mind takes away their meaning. And they are connected with the unity of everything, although we may not notice this. I give a few examples. I suddenly saw the reason for everything. I realised that no one knew anything. I saw my hand for the first time. I suddenly knew that it did not matter. I saw I could only be myself. These phrases convey very little to us, yet they are descriptions of the experiences of different people who saw something quite unusual. In all such moments, our understanding has power over us. I mean that at such moments we see from the authority of our own understanding and not from what we believe to be right, not from what we think we ought to think, not from opinion, imitation or habit. But a moment later this special kind of insight is swallowed up and we are no longer ourselves, no longer separated from the effects of things upon us which enter through our senses. The conviction of our insight passes. Something quite definite has happened. What has happened? We can say that the passive has replaced the momentary activity of the active mind. Consciousness has changed its level in the psychical ladder. In terms of Flood's triangles, consciousness belonging to the upper triangle has been replaced by the form of consciousness belonging to the lower. I have already mentioned the modern views of Hewnings Jackson about levels. Neurological teaching is aware of the existence of levels. In connection with Jackson's views that the various manifestation of nervous disorder cannot be regarded merely from the standpoint of the nervous tissue that is destroyed or functionally out of use, but must also be considered from the side of what remains, I wrote in 1918, quote, What remains is now overactive. The fact that the school marshes away will lead to uproar in the classroom, end quote, from Conception of Regression in Psychological Medicine, The Lancet, June 8, 1918. The uproar is the manifest side of the clinical picture. The absence of the school master is the silent side. From this idea of superior and inferior modes of function arose the general conception of psychological regression, that is, that under certain circumstances inferior modes of function become active apart from actual disruption of tissues. A person becomes a baby. But as I said before, the evolutionary standpoint does not give us the idea that still higher levels exist in us. On the psychological side, Jackson spoke of two levels, the dream and the waking levels. Neurologically, a study of the cortex of the brain shows the existence of several levels of nerve cells, 
more or less defined, but we do not really know what functions they subserve. I have already mentioned that there is some evidence to show that we do not use the brain as a whole. On the psychological side, the teaching of Jung has emphasised the necessity for man to reach individualization through the balancing of his functions. Modern life makes him one-sided, in such a way that his unexpressed functions continually hamper him. He derives little pleasure from his work. To become normal, man must become balanced in such a way that thinking, feeling, sensation and intuition play equal parts in his life. Man is sick because one or another function usurps the place of the rest. But looking back on the insight I gained through this teaching, I realised that I did not understand that a man must strive towards a higher degree of consciousness to make it possible for the function in him to reach any state of balance. I had the idea of normal man only in an ordinary sense, which is insufficient because it implies, or rather implied to me, at ordinary standards and viewpoints merely intensified and not absolutely new forms of understanding. That is, it implied to me continuous degrees of extension, not discrete degrees. I imagined that unity of being could be reached within the customary state of consciousness. I believed, in other words, that a radical change of being could take place as one was, merely through some adjustments. This is probably what most of us think, for we do not realise that in order to change anything in ourselves, everything else must change, lest by trying to change one thing we create wrong results in other directions. Change of being is not a patchwork process. All sorts of minor modifications are no doubt possible in people without necessarily harmful results. A person talks over his troubles with someone and feels the better for it. But for any real change that is going to be permanent, the whole standpoint has to change and for this a new understanding of the world is necessary, as well as quite new sorts of effort in connection with oneself. In this respect I had no idea, save insofar as I saw that psychological regression was a movement backwards in the life itself, that a different understanding of time was necessary, in order to loosen deeply ingrained emotional and mental habits which otherwise cannot be loosened. It was only later that I realised the necessity of starting afresh for a form of teaching which gave entirely new standpoints. Above all, it was necessary to throw aside these evolutionary ideas that are impressed upon everyone who undergoes a scientific training, for taken by themselves they make it impossible to believe in an existing but unused higher structure in man, since they emphasise the view that everything that man possesses has been the result of a natural selection of serviceable variations in the past, occurring through immediate response to environment. We have, of course, always a difficulty of defining what environment really means. Today we have to take into account the enormous quantity of radiations with which the universe is filled, and whose action on man, apart from that of light, is unknown. From the standpoint of this volume, we are living in a world of certain definite limitations as regards higher space, an unabridged reality sectioned out to our weak experience. It is one of the characteristics of this abridged reality that gives it the illusion that we can escape from everything through passing time. Now this is thinking according to the passive mind. It requires an act of mental creation to bring the dimension of time itself into existence and realise that we can neither escape from anything nor lose anything. This act of creation is a form of thinking which can awaken the active mind, which understands time. I must repeat that we do not and cannot understand time with the passive mind, nor do we understand about it through any theories about dimensions. But unless we make the effort to think in that direction and build a scaffolding of some kind, Inner direct perceptions about time will not be likely to reach us. We are supposing that it is possible to attract the action of the active mind by preparing the passive mind for it and, as I said, following Flood and Richard, we can imagine that the highest range of the passive mind takes on something of the qualities belonging to the active mind as by descent of the higher into the lower. In dealing with this subject, indeed, Swedenborg makes the striking observation which I do not pretend to understand, 
that the natural understanding can rise to the topmost of the three discontinuous degrees that he divides the mind into. In such a case, a man would be able to have far more than ordinary knowledge, but he would not be real because it would not influence him authoritatively, i.e., by that conviction of truth which characterises the working of the active mind. And a man will only believe in it through his self-love when he is talking about it to others. He will not believe in it when he is alone. I said before that any proof plainly demonstrable to sense of higher reality would be contrary to the nature of man. The active mind would, in that case, not be called into play. We would see with outer sense what we have to understand with inner sense. Knowing or seeing by understanding is a far more real experience than any external seeing. Since the passive mind works in connection with the senses, it is not itself the true sight of this invisible one self, which is capable of different degrees of understanding things that are distinct from external fact. I must beg the reader to remember that the inner perception of truth or knowing by understanding is something quite different from external truth, which is lodged in the outer mind and relates to the size, position, weight, etc. of objects. Such facts as the latter never really influence the spirit of a man. They never can change us. They are essential in all our external relationships to life, but they do not fill those inner systems which, when they run dry, make life entirely barren and meaningless. The kind of knowledge which we get from such facts does not have the power over us that understanding from the active mind has when there is a moment of insight or revelation. Now the ordinary education which we receive in life can be thought of as developing the passive mind. It is gained through the senses from outside. We learn a great many facts, not noticing as a rule that these so-called facts are constantly changing just as everything else does in time. For we take these facts in an absolute sense and in later life are inclined to be offended if they are exploded. I mentioned in an early chapter the inner rigidity we fall into. Now there has always existed the idea of a second education, one not given by life and not based on shifting knowledge but on a permanent knowledge concerning the nature of man. If we say that the ordinary education of life is to lead forth the passive mind, we might formulate the nature of this second education as a process involving ideas and methods of a particular kind whose object is to lead forth the active mind. In connection with this strange subject we find a special idea, that man only becomes free through his active understanding. If we recall the psychical ladder of Richard we can perceive that the upper levels are farthest from sense interpretation, whatever we understand by that. It was held that sense interpretation, which I suppose we can call materialism or positivism, bound a man. This interesting idea, mentioned before, is clearly expressed in the following passage. Quote, the intelligible substance, if it is drawn near to God, has power over itself. If it falls away, it chooses the corporal world and in that way becomes subject to the necessity which rules the cosmos. End quote. Stobaya, the Hermetica, 8. What is to be understood by the intelligible substance drawing near to God? Does it not simply mean an ascent of this ladder of degrees of consciousness within us? Quote, the idea of God is the idea of our own spiritual natures enlarged to infinity. End quote. William E. Channing. To put God inside us is itself a reversal for our material conception of God is as something outside in the sensible world. But God is closer than the neck vein because understanding is not outside us and to understand differently in a new way is always close to us, because this ladder of consciousness is within us. Outside is the world of experience, inside are degrees of understanding. And if the intelligible substance draws near, another understanding of things, it draws near to God, i.e. to an enlargement of consciousness. It all depends upon what we make most important. As Plato said, there are three things soul, body and money, and all three have their place. From the Republican 9. It is remarkable how we put God outside us, 
how we cannot get away from a three-dimensional view of things. Quote, the kingdom of heaven is within you, and whosoever knoweth himself shall find it. End quote. Yet do we ever see the matter in this way? Do we comprehend that God is understanding, and that the worst our understanding, the more tyrannical and outside does God seem to us, and the more slavery we are in? Man gains freedom only through the use of his higher faculties. Materialism makes him more and more a slave to the forces of the phenomenal world. It is easier for us to take things as they appear, nay, even feel that we can deal with everything by means of our logic and even conquer nature. The point is, however, that such an outlook does not call into activity the unawakened higher degrees of understanding. Therefore, it means that we remain handicapped although it looks as if our attitude were extremely practical. The crux of the matter lies just in what we think about the potential nature of man. If we believe that there are no further degrees of understanding in us, that we are products of a mechanical selection without surplus, then we must insist upon a purely rational or logical approach to life, since we have this degree of understanding naturally. If we believe otherwise, then we must take our reason or logic only as one partial and very necessary approach to life, but not inclusive to other forms of understanding. The hermetic fragment, while showing that a materialistic standpoint goes ultimately against our own interest, indicates a principle of freedom and also the source of our slavery. The more man is turned towards the corporal world and argues from the sensible alone, the more will he fall under the power of necessity, i.e. the more enslaved he becomes by outward things. Our present-day materialism points in this direction, that is, in the direction of the enslavement of man by mechanisation and by its direct results, by state organisations, uniformity, the sacrifice of independent intelligence, the sweeping away of individual differences, local customs, local diversity, and all the infinite branches of humanity that enrich life. In this connection we can look further into the hermetic point of view. Man is made free by truth. The truth spoken of here is equated with mind. We might understand that noetic experience is meant, that at another level of consciousness we can understand infinitely better than we do at present. This more comprehensive and subtle grasp this more delicate perception is the beginning of truth and its effect is to free us. We find in the New Testament the phrase, the truth shall make you free. This kind of truth, we are told in many places, begins with self-knowledge. Truth about the corporal world is secondary to it. Some would say that any real understanding of the corporal world is consequent upon it. The acquisition of this kind of truth or mind was the hermetic goal. It was the solution of the mystery of existence, of the extraordinary, inexplicable conundrum of life. Everything is wrong in the world, everything in a state of confusion, because man has not this truth, and so remains unfinished. He lives under its level, and so never can understand how to act or think rightly. Viewed in the light of hermetic philosophy, man blindly gropes his way about a dark world, using a form of understanding which can never furnish him with answers to the most important questions that vex his soul. Yet the Creator made him in the image of an eternal being and sent him down as a mortal creature, not merely to be an ornament of the earth and become conscious of its created form, but to attain truth. For example, in a hermetic allegory of the first century, man's situation is put in these words, quote, Man has this advantage speech and mind. Speech God imparted to all men, but mind he did not, not that he grudged it to any for the grudging temper comes from souls of men who are devoid of mind. The pupil asks, tell me why God did not impart mind to all? It was his will that mind should be placed in the midst as a prize that human souls may win. Where did he place it? He filled a great basin with mind and sent it down to earth, and he appointed a herald and bade him make proclamation to the hearts of men. Hearken each human heart, dip yourself in this basin, if you can, recognising for what purpose you have been made, 
and believing that you shall ascend to him who sent the basin down. Now those who gave heed to the proclamation and dipped themselves in the bath of mind, these men got a share of knowledge, they received mind, and so became complete men. End quote. Hermetica Libellius, 4, page 151. We must understand that this mind, spoken of here, is not our ordinary reasoning mind, but something belonging to degrees above it. Is it not the second triangle? In this passage it is very clearly brought out that man is incomplete without this mind, or higher level, and that the aim of life is the reaching of it, i.e. this is the real significance behind the life of man, to which everything is secondary. We know that when the rich man asked how he could gain eternal life, the answer was, If you will be perfect, follow me. The meaning in the Greek is to reach one's goal. Sin meant, in the original, missing the mark. The psychological idea emerges quite clearly when we consider the real meaning of these two words. The goal is to perfect oneself, to become complete, and sin is all that that causes one to miss the goal. This perfecting was a question of following a way, a path, to have a path. The rich man may not have known that in asking for eternal life he was asking for the completion of himself, and one that he had to bring about for himself. He is told to follow an extremely difficult and scarcely understood teaching. He may even have thought that eternal life meant just what we all think, if we connect eternity with the idea of prolonged time. He is told, and told in an unmistakable way, that eternal life means, first of all, the completing of oneself in this life. I think that the hermetic allegory about the basin of mind shows us the same thing. It did not mean to die physically. It meant beginning to struggle for something that we do not ordinarily struggle for, for we are merely state, something required requiring great patience, something obviously very difficult to grasp. Quote, let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. End quote. And once again I venture to call the attention of the reader to the point so often mentioned before, that another understanding of time, a vision that reached beyond time, was always held to be essential for the attainment of this higher state of man. For example, quote, we look not at the things seen, but at the things not seen, for things seen are of time, but things not seen are of eternity. End quote. This means simply that taking everything as it appears, thinking only from the standpoint of a three-dimensional world in passing time, we cannot get beyond the level of our natural understanding, cannot rise to another feeling of our existence, to that aeon from which we are derived. Perhaps we scarcely notice that in every direction our natural understanding leads us to nothing. We come either to contradiction or to the unknown. Seeking for an explanation of the phenomenal universe with the phenomenally based mind, we fail to get beyond a certain point because we have not the necessary ideas. We have remarked how the ideas of the third dimension would explain many things to the paper beings. For example, the entry of the third dimension into their world would be the real explanation of what appeared to them to be growth. The lead point of the pencil slowly entering their world would certainly appear to grow. It would surround itself gradually with a wooden covering. It would appear to them first as a small seed, a point of lead, that had the capacity for growing and secreting wood. We do not think of the growth of a seed in our world in the same way. We cannot imitate growth. Growth is from inside. Higher dimensions enter our world from inside, from the direction of the most minute. We merely see a seed turning into a plant or a child growing into a man in passing time and think of it in an external way as a kind of accretion of matter coming from outside. We do not see it as something coming through the seed into our world or through the child from within the entry of another dimension, which for us is passing time. We think that the flower is potentially in the seed, and that life grows from the seed, not that life enters through the seed into manifestation. We do not conceive a generative idea behind the seed, and the seed is a minute receptive machine into which the generative world of form passes. 
In the same way, we can never understand what instinct is because we look for its seat in material structure. But instinct is not comprehensible in such terms. The higher world enters the lower on all sides, in fault, feeling, instinct, event. Generative form, which endows a thing with meaning, is not to be confused with material form. It enters material form. Instinct is form, idea in this sense. We only know serial form just as we only know events as a succession of related incidents. Higher form is gathered into a unity outside time and the relationship of material form to this higher form gives meaning. The study of life is the study of the meaning and use of things, not simply analysing material structure. The circumstances under which the best expression of a thing is given is what should concern us. The study of matter does not afford this result, for it does away with what a thing is, and is for, by getting below its most significant level. In this way, science complicates life by continually reaching below its level and missing the idea. If we think that flower and man are potential in seed and child, in the physiological properties of their tissues, we are right in one way, only we speak from the standpoint of the three-dimensional world in passing time and must attribute extraordinary properties to matter itself. But when we think of growth as due to the entry of higher dimensions, we speak from another point of view, seeing the connection between visible and invisible, between higher and lower space. As I said, the realisation of higher space reverses the direction of our thought, just at that point where our ordinary thought comes to an end, having gone so far as it can, so that only beyond seems nothing, lies the place where another kind of thinking can begin. We cannot get beyond with the form of thinking that is based on the three-dimensional world in passing time. Another kind of thinking is necessary, one that does not belong to the passive but to the active mind, or at least begins to imitate the latter. The appearance of this kind of thinking, or rather the birth of active mind, has been sometimes described as revelation. Goethe depicts Faust as having reached the place of nothing in his quest for truth. After investigating all branches of human knowledge, Faust finds no answers that satisfy him. He exclaims, And here I am at last, a very fool, with useless learning cursed, no wiser than at first. End quote. There seems to be nothing. All his learning proves to be useless. Looking round him, he sees no way out. At this point, he is faced with despair. His quest becomes meaningless. Meaninglessness is the worst thing that can assail us. Like the Medusa, it turns us to stone. From what direction can Faust recapture meaning, new meaning? At first, he sees no direction in which to go. Quote, the fancy too has died away, the hope that I might in my day instruct and elevate mankind. End quote. Through the best, as we usually suppose, of the human aspirations, the desire to help humanity, he is nevertheless led to absolutely nothing. In what direction does he turn? The movement of the soul is, of course, poetically treated. He opens an ancient book and catches sight of the sign of the macrocosmos the great world that overshadows the visible fragment in the present moment. The hieroglyph is the seal of Solomon, the two triangles placed upside down, signifying the interpenetration of lower and higher space, the passive and active mind. A change passes over him, and he exclaims, Ha! Ah, what new life divine! Intense! Floods in a moment every sense! I feel the dawn of youth again! Was it a god who wrote these signs? End quote. What moment of the soul's experience is being described? Has he not touched another degree of understanding discontinuous with his former level? Formerly he had tried to increase his knowledge by continuous degrees of extension, and it led him into nothing. In the light of a quite new understanding of the world, he exclaims, Oh, how the spell before my sight brings nature's hidden ways to light! See, all things with each other blending! Each to each its being lending, all on each in turn depending, heavenly ministers descending, and again to heaven ascending, floating, mingling, interweaving. Can heart of man embrace illimitable nature? End quote. 
The visible world vanishes into illimitable nature, seeing with the eye of mind freed from time and sense, from things merely as they seem. His vision is surely similar to that seen by Jacob in the wilderness. Both can be understood as allegories relating to the inner experience of Scow. Jacob came to a certain place and the sun was set. As in the case of Faust, he is in darkness. Here a vision of a ladder appears to him extending from earth to heaven. Quote, and Jacob lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set and he took of the stones at that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed and behold a ladder set upon the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the spirits of God ascending and descending on it. End quote. Genesis 28, 10-12 Like Faust, the world is transfigured for him. He perceives the scale of reality that is the true universe, and this comes just at the point when his journey had led him to darkness, as did Faust's journey in search of knowledge. Many allegorical descriptions of this experience exist in older literature in which the place of nothing is indicated by a dark forest, a wilderness, a desert, etc. Faust touches new energies. His despair turns to joy. He sees things the other way round. The active mind awakens. The invisible enters the visible on all sides. Visibilia ex invisibilius faced by negation and so with petrification of soul. Something is released in him and touches realities beyond sense. Has he not hit upon the divine sense of Perseus who escaped from being turned to stone by the Medusa, it would seem, through the art of seeing things the other way round? Perseus avoids death by looking at the Medusa in the mirror of Athena. Thereby he slays the Medusa and releases Pegasus who mounts to heaven is not this an allegorical about man and his eternal nature? In this connection, let us reflect on the original significance of the word faith. Its meaning seems to have been mental, mental perception of the reality of the invisible. Faith is another form of understanding through which force enters us. It is the evidence of things not seen. Quote, now faith is a conviction of the reality of things which we do not see. Through faith we understand that the worlds, aeons, came into being and still exist at the command of God, so that what is seen does not owe its existence to that which is visible. End quote, Hebrews 11, 1-3. Another definition of faith is given in the Gospels when the Roman captain asked Christ to heal his servant. Jesus said, I will come and cure him. The captain replied, Sir, I am not a fit person to receive you under my roof. Merely say the word and my boy will be cured. For I myself am also under authority and have soldiers under me. To one I say go, and he goes. To another come, and he comes. And to my slave do this or that, and he does it. Jesus was astonished and said, In no Israelite have I found such great faith. And that's from Matthew 8. Here faith is clearly the recognition of scow, the certain knowledge that there is that which is above and that which is beneath, and that everyone stands at some point in this scow or ladder of being. Scow, scala, ladder. Bruner defines faith as personal decision about invisible things, a question of, quote, I myself, not my thought, not my world standpoint. In faith, man becomes certain that he has himself, not in himself. End quote. Emil Brunner. Another writer defined new birth as reaching an absolute mental certainty of the reality of what the senses do not show. Is not this reversal? We must realise the profound psychological significance of such views. In this connection, let us glance at the meaning of repentance. As in the case of the word faith, we probably think of some emotional attitude, even a blind one. But the Greek word translated as repentance means change of mind and nothing else. Is it not then another way of thinking about things through which the mind is open to a higher degree? No one can change in himself or add a cubit to his stature by taking thought just with these forms of thought which he has always used. How could he? Something new must enter him. But do we ever think of it in this way? 
must he not have contact with ideas that he does not naturally possess? Whatever forms Christianity assumed in later times, however distorted it became, it must be remembered that its introduction was heralded by John the Baptist, preaching change of mind as the first step towards eternal life. And this change of mind was connected by him with the teaching on the kingdom of heaven, an idea so difficult to grasp and so contrary to all sense thinking and external evidence that it remains a new idea for all time. Long before the period of Christianity, Socrates spoke of two directions in which the soul can be turned. Quote, the soul, when using the body as an instrument of perception, that is to say, when using the sense of sight and hearing, or some other sense, for the meaning of perceiving through the body is perceiving through the senses, is dragged by the body through the region of the changeable, the temporal, and wanders about it and is confused. The world spins round her. She is like a drunkard when she touches change, but when returning into herself she reflects, then she passes into the region of eternity. End quote. This movement of the soul is in the direction of that level of mind on which it can see truth, the first aspect of which is truth about man's own invisible nature, himself, which he reaches through self-knowledge. It is a reversal of the natural movement of the soul. There are two sides to man's life. Quote, there are ruling powers, one set over the intelligible, the invisible, mind-understood world, and the other over the visible world. End quote, Republic. To the visible world belongs perceptible truth, but this does not cover the whole range of truth. It does not define truth. Perceptual truth is from sensation. One who disagrees with our sensations, who says it is hot when we think it is cold, disturbs this level of truth. If we are accustomed to surrender the value of our own impressions, sensations, to the opinions of others, we feel that we are not getting right impressions and that something is wrong with us. If we believe in our sensations strongly, we merely think that there is something wrong with the other person. A division of people is possible in this respect, those who are firmly fixed in their sensations and those who are not. The latter feel that another's perceptions are more reliable than their own or are indifferent to perceptions. Of course, this has nothing to do with the interpretation of sensations or our opinions. But the point is that sensation is one level of truth only. We say, it is raining. If someone looks through the window, denies this, we attempt to reinforce his sensations by taking him out and making him feel the rain on his skin. He then agrees with us. We cannot imagine anybody denying so perceptible a fact at the moment. But later on he may deny it, when the evidence of the senses is no longer present, and then we either think of him as having a bad memory or as deliberately lying. All this belongs mainly to the perceptual consciousness, and in the main our modern idea of truth and what truth is, is connected with this order of truth, which is a matter of sensation or outer perception. All these quotations and examples show us one thing, that something must start in the mind apart from the evidence of the senses, in that journey that leads to another level of understanding. To begin with, it means that we can no longer think in the same way. We have to begin to think in a new way if we wish to enter upon that science of the soul, whose aim is to effect a definite transformation of a man's nature. And it is the sense of something greater that is the starting point. It is this and only this that can begin to effect some reversal in us, which gradually frees us from the power of outer things, which completely dominates our ordinary existence and makes us little better than machines. It is this reversal that, in a sense, ultimately constitutes the change, not the momentary revelation of Faust, which is, after all, nothing but a prelude to all his subsequent spiritual experiences, nor the flash of another consciousness described by Tennyson, nor any emotional crisis of conversion, but a long process, a struggle between one form of understanding on one side and all that internally goes with it, all the features of this time and sense machinery, the succession of eyes, this present momentness of things, the distorted sense of others, 
consequent on our unsatisfied craving for duplication, the small orbit of meanings in which we daily revolve, the limited notions we have of existence, the narrow view of the world and the narrow resultant attitudes, and on the other side, a new form of understanding that is far nearer than we imagine, that touches us, indeed on all sides, and that we really know about only cannot hold, cannot remember, cannot make distinct and effective, save by long effort. Is it not only through the recognition of scowl, faith in ourselves, that we escape from the negation of life? The terrible power of negation surrounds us on all sides. Some unusually bad experience, some horrible disaster, some loss, summons the spirit of negation in a moment into our thoughts. Everything turns black. We seem to be only creatures of passing time, living in a world of frustration that we can make nothing of. The world then seems only evil. Only the worst side of things draws our attention. The will becomes negative. How can we, without any new ideas of what it is that we have to do, prevent ourselves from falling into apathy, characterised by the fact that we no longer try to understand anything but cheerfully or otherwise get along as best we can? Kierkegaard found the solution of saying yea to life in winning the repetition of events. Barth says, quote, When the excitement of life's affirmation has, for no doubt, some quite valid reason called off, men will turn to life's negation, complaining that the world is in itself evil, that it is created in vanity, winningly or the plaything, maybe of some demiurge, in quote, Barth, Romans. Then the world is seen as Ramsay saw it, as the creation of a demon. Only a special attitude can rescue us. The necessity is to create something additional in ourselves. The whole concept of a possible higher state, psychologically verifiable, is an answer to this situation. Is it not only through clearly seeing that creation is subject to vanity and frustration that a man can find in himself the strength to take hold of his life and begin to separate himself from the chaos within and without. He will discover that the secret is in himself, in his willingness to become something else, to be something. For yea lies in I, and I is to be. He will then no longer see the world merely as vanity, but as a series of conditions, often of extraordinary significance to him, for the exercise of his own soul. But having no idea that there is any such exercise and never understanding that the universe is in himself for him to change and that its evolution for him is a series of mental transformations in himself, he will always remain concerned with what will only seem the confusion of outer life, never understanding why it does not give him what he expects and so always blame him, or trying to solve problems which through the very action of passing time are incapable of any external solution.